Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Lisa here for uh, another episode uh, to demystify coronavirus, the pandemic, and COVID-19. And I'm so happy I have Dr. Barney Graham with us today, who I see as a research icon. But I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Dr. Graham. All right. Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, I'm the deputy director at the Vaccine Research Center uh, at NIH on the NIH campus in Bethesda. And I don't know how much more you want to know about me, but. Well, just tell people in plain speak and plain language what you do, particularly with respect to coronavirus right now. All right. Well, I was trained as a physician in infectious diseases and then did a PhD in microbiology and immunology. And I've spent most of my career working on viruses and immunology and the things you need to know to make a vaccine. A lot of that was motivated, as you know, uh, from the disaster of HIV and AIDS that came uh, at us in the 1980s, which is when I was during my training. And so many people my age uh, have devoted a lot of their lives to viral immunology and infectious diseases, vaccinology, trying to uh, find a solution for HIV. And the Vaccine Research Center was established in 2000 on the NIH campus specifically to focus on developing an HIV vaccine. And uh, we are not successful yet. We have not made an HIV vaccine, but the technologies that have been developed, the ways of thinking about uh, viruses and immunology that have been developed because of that work on HIV have given us the tools to find solutions for a lot of other problems, uh, including this new coronavirus, Another virus I work on, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, and uh, a few others. And we have some really promising work coming along on universal influenza vaccine. So I am a virologist and I have worked on vaccines for 35 years. So you mentioned a lot of the success we've had related to coronavirus and these vaccines is linked to your work with HIV. And I'm glad you brought that up because they're, even on the street, I hear people saying, well, I don't trust these vaccines. They were produced too quickly. How, you know, we don't have a vaccine for HIV. How do we have one for a coronavirus? What would you say to them? Well, one of my great regrets in my life is that we were not able yet to figure out a vaccine for HIV. It's, the biology is just so complicated for making the right kind of immune responses to protect us from HIV. And fortunately, in that case, a lot of new, a lot of drugs have been developed, antiviral drugs that can um, that can protect you and reduce the amount of HIV in your body. So the drugs are working, but you take that after infection. I, I like to prevent infections. And so vaccines are developed to prevent infections. And, and unfortunately, uh, we have not done that yet for HIV. And a lot, of the, <clears throat> a lot of the work on the coronavirus really was a direct uh, consequence of our work on respiratory syncytial virus that happened, especially between around 2010 and 2012, where we learned uh, how to um, define exactly the atomic level structure of the proteins on the surface of the virus and, and found out how important it was to hold them in the right shape and the right confirmation. Because when uh, your antibodies see uh, a virus or see a foreign thing, they recognize it by the shapes, the surface contours, the very subtle changes in the a way a protein is folded is how an antibody recognizes that protein. And through our work on RSV, uh, it we, we learned a lot about how to use those tools of structural biology, and it really, really paid off uh, during this last coronavirus outbreak. So the RSV vaccine uh, is coming along and it looks very promising, but it's more on the normal 
pathway of 10 or 12 years at least. And so it's in phase three trials. We published uh, those findings in 2013, and we're hoping that by around 2024 or so, maybe we'll have the data we would need to say that we now have an RSV vaccine. So we're excited about that, but that's 11 years. And uh, of course, we're used to RSV. It's a terrible disease, but uh, we're used to it. And so it wasn't uh, considered to be a crisis or something that needed to be done so quickly. There wasn't as much government support or uh, worldwide panic about what was happening in order to, to get that done on a shorter timeline. Yeah. So if RSV took 10 to 11 years, we still don't have an HIV vaccine. What's so different about coronavirus that allowed us to have a vaccine in less than a year? I think people really want to understand the difference. Yeah, so, several things. Um, one is that we had coronaviruses threaten us before in 2002 from the SARS-1 and in 2012 and 13 from the MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Coronavirus. And the first SARS was frightening. It had a mortality rate of about 10% and it spread through uh, many parts of the world. But after about nine or 10,000 people, it disappeared. And uh, we were very lucky that it uh, uh, disappeared. It, it still really isn't understood how that happened. Uh, the MERS coronavirus, it has about a 40% mortality rate and it stayed regional. It's stayed pretty much within the Middle East. Every once in a while there's an outbreak, but it doesn't spread as easily as this virus. But because of what we learned about RSV in 2013 and happening right at the time of that MERS uh, coronavirus uh, crisis, in, uh, especially in Saudi Arabia, we uh, changed the focus of our work from RSV to coronaviruses because nothing was known about the structure of coronavirus proteins. And so we spent three years figuring out uh, the structure of the spike protein on a human coronavirus called HKE1. Once we had the structure of that spike protein, uh, we were able to find ways of stabilizing that and holding it together, similar to the way we did with the RSVF protein. And we did the same thing with other viruses like a virus called Nipah uh, that has causes problems on almost a yearly basis now in Bangladesh and India, and Malaysia sometimes. And it is a different type of virus, but it has a similar type of protein. So we also did uh, that protein. And because of uh, some work we did with Moderna during 2016 Zika crisis, when we made a DNA vaccine, they made an RNA vaccine, and we tested them both in our, our, in our own hands. And uh, their mRNA vaccine was more potent than our DNA vaccine. And so we said, uh, you know, this is a, a, a type of vaccine that can be rapidly manufactured. And if we're going to keep responding to these pandemic threats, we need a better plan. Mm. So we uh, started in 2017 a plan with Moderna to do something we call the prototype pathogen approach to pandemic preparedness. And this is a, something I wrote about kind of in response to all the things we've had to do for chikungunya and Ebola and everything. What's that's chikungunya? Connected. Chikungunya is a different kind of virus. It's an alpha virus. It's a mosquito borne virus that came into the Caribbean and uh, Central and South America back in 2012. And it doesn't kill that many people, but it's a terrible disease because it leaves a lot of people with chronic arthritis. And so it's, it also um, waned as the immunity increased from the infection, uh, uh, it, it started going away. But, but then MERS came and then Ebola came in West Africa in an unusual way. And then Zika came and you know, then Ebola came back again in 2018. So we uh, have been working toward a better approach to pandemic preparedness. 
And we were combining what we call our precision antigen design, you know, atomic level antigen design of protein that you Those need. Those are big that. words, Dr. Graham. Okay, so <laughs> so we we want to design the protein in a way that is perfectly replicates this structure. And this this 3D print is about 10 million times bigger than the actual protein, but we can see it in this kind of detail. Mm -hmm. So we can now do protein engineering to make the protein look just like this and hold it in that shape. So we call that precision vaccine design. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to combine that with Moderna's rapid manufacturing so that we could make not just a fast vaccine, but a really good vaccine. And that was the whole idea. And we were using the MERS coronavirus as the prototype for coronaviruses and the NEPA as the prototype for paramyxoviruses. And we had a plan actually to start a clinical trial with the mRNA that we'd already shown worked for NEPA in 2020 when this whole new outbreak came. We also had evidence that the mRNA of the spike for MERS could protect uh, mice against a lethal challenge with the MERS coronavirus. So we already had evidence that the mRNA using our protein designs could be an effective vaccine. And when this thing uh, came at, at the end of 2019, having already had the relationship with Moderna, having uh, relationships with three or four other academic labs uh, over coronavirus that we've been working on really intensively since about 2014. And, um, having uh, the resources that we have at NIH we, and knowing what to do, we said we, we already knew that the same modifications we made to the protein for the other coronaviruses worked for about a dozen other coronaviruses. So we said we need to take our idea and just go with it with Moderna, even though they're a small biotech company we can help support uh, some of the studies they need to do to get this vaccine moving and, and start the phase one trial and see how, how we can do. So we were in a very strong position at the beginning of this outbreak, poised to prove to other people that we could do this rapidly and already with a plan in, in, in mind and a way of making the vaccine. So. On July 11th, when we got the sequences from the, the Chinese... Uh, you mean January 11th? I'm sorry, January 11th of 2020, when we got the uh, sequences from this Chinese virus, we were able to design um, the sequences that we needed on our computers by aligning everything with the old coronaviruses we worked with. And and give Moderna uh, by the 13th or 14th of January, the sequence that we recommended that they make for the vaccine. And then they made it within about 40 days. They made a clinical grade product uh, in 40 days because they had been developing this technology uh, for uh, personalized cancer vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of the personalized cancer vaccines is you you study the cancer in the person, do sequencing, find the things that are wrong about the sequence and make a vaccine against those parts that had changed. And so they wanna turn that around and get that vaccine back to the patient within a month or, or two at, at the most. So they had developed these approaches for rapidly making clinical grade material. And so we were able to get a, a phase one vaccine study started within about 65 days after we first got the sequence uh, by, by working round the clock, getting all the animal studies done ahead of time, getting everything set up to do the phase one trial. And by then it was around March 18th. And a few days later, I think it was declared a pandemic by the WHO. And, and at that time, we realized it was no longer a demonstration project. We really had to keep moving on this, and, and we did, and with a lot of help from thousands and thousands of people and with a lot of money. A lot of money was poured into this by the federal government, 
help Moderna grow into a, a, a larger company and to create the manufacturing capacity uh, that was needed to actually do this because RNA had never been scaled up to, meaning they produced thousands of doses, but they'd never produced millions of doses, let alone hundreds of millions of doses or billions of doses. And so that process of manufacturing of going from thousands to hundreds of millions, that costs a lot of money. And most companies will not make that choice or decision unless uh, the government takes the risk out of it for them. So the government produced a lot of money uh, that allowed things to happen in parallel during that year. And we were finally able to get into a phase three trial by uh, July 27th. And by November 8th, uh, we had an answer about whether it was going to work or not. And so it was a remarkable year and uh, it, it was an exhausting year, but uh, there was a lot of people, a lot of money, and a lot of prior knowledge and a lot of prior relationships that had already been set up that made that possible. Yeah. Wow. So I'm so glad you outlined the history. It's really important for people to understand this has been going on for a long time. This is how science works. And basically, we encountered a perfect storm that allowed all of these things to come together, right? So it was, uh, yeah, it was a perfect anti-storm, I guess. <laughs>